Good evening. I'm Dick Meserv, the president of the Carnegie Institution, and I'd like to welcome you to this book event. Uh, we're co-hosting tonight's event with the Center for Global Ethics at George Mason University. In the early 1990s, the science of ecology, excuse me, the early 1900s, the science of ecology was young and immature. Many ridiculed it. One prominent, prominent scientist called it a fad, yet the Carnegie Institution supported and nurtured it. Over the next century, ecology played a major role defining the work of Carnegie's Department of Plant Biology, which is located in Stanford, California. The scientists there helped lay the groundwork for the current explosion in global ecology research. By 2001, the institution recognized that the field of ecology had reached a level of maturity and global importance that it merited its own department. Today, scientists at Carnegie's Department of Global Ecology, which is also located at Stanford, are leaders in bringing the dangers of global warming to the world's attention. In 2007, the department's director, Chris Field, was one of only two Americans to represent the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change at the Nobel Prize ceremonies in Stockholm. And Chris was recently selected to chair Working Group 2, which is the group studying mitigation and adaptation in the next IPCC assessment. Today, research at Carnegie and elsewhere has led to the inescapable conclusion that humanity is on the brink of a climate disaster. We've come to understand that we must change our voracious consumption of fossil fuel or we risk altering our environment so profoundly that we threaten our very existence. We clearly need to find another way. Human ingenuity has solved difficult questions in the past, but never has so much depended on human ingenuity and never have the stakes been higher. Many believe that solutions to our energy and climate crises, climate crises require new ways of thinking, not only about our habits, lifestyles, and governments, but also with regard to science and technology, which clearly must play a critical role as well both in defining the problems and in developing solutions. Traditionally, I think we all have compartmented science. We have taught our children to see the parts and not the whole. But as our knowledge of the world has increased, so is the realization that nature is not compartmentalized. It is complex and multidimensional. As we learn more about the Earth and its systems, we find it all but impossible to separate knowledge into traditional categories of biology, geology, and geophysics. Science, like nature, is integrated and dynamic. Today, in this special event, presented in conjunction with the Center for Global Ethics of George Mason, our guests, Eric Roston and James Gustav Speff, will challenge us to look at our understanding of energy and the environment from new perspectives and with new ways of thinking. They will push us to have an integrated and holistic perspective. I very much look forward to their talks, and I'm especially pleased to welcome Gus Beth. As many years ago, we labored together on energy issues when we were both colleagues in government. Let me turn the podium over to the co-sponsor for this evening's lecture, Dr. Andrew Light. Uh, he will introduce our speakers. Dr. Light is the director of George Mason's Center for Global Ethics. He is also a professor of philosophy and environment policy, environmental policy at George Mason. Again. We're really pleased you could join us this evening. Thank you all for coming out on such a, a rainy night. And also, you may have heard that actually one of the presidential campaigns suggested we actually postpone the forum tonight. <laughs> You know, until the banking crisis is resolved. But after talking to, to Gus and Eric, they insisted that they could do more than, you know, one thing at a time, and they could actually be here tonight. So, so thanks again for that. Um, I'm honored to introduce tonight's speakers and also very grateful to Dr. Reserve for allowing the Center for Global Ethics at George Mason the opportunity to co-host tonight's event with the Carnegie Institution. Uh, the Center for Global Ethics at George Mason was established in 2004 to promote publicly relevant research on ethical issues of global importance. 
As such, global climate change and the unprecedented challenge it poses to our national and international institutions of science and science policy like this one is squarely within our mission. After a few years of in hibernation, the center was restarted this year when I was hired and appointed its second director. So speaking on behalf of myself and my assistant, uh, Nick Barker, who also helped to make tonight's evening possible, we're very pleased that our inaugural relaunching event could be here, signaling the firm intention of the center to join the broader intellectual community in and around Washington, D.C., working on this issue and others. Dr. James Gustav Speth is the Carl W. Knobloch, Jr. Dean of the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies at Yale University. He's also the Sarah Schallenberger Brown Professor in the Practice of Environmental Policy at Yale. A graduate of Yale College, Dr. Speth earned a master's degree from Oxford University before returning to Yale to earn his law degree in 1969. Since then, he has been a leader and founder of environmental organizations. He co-founded the National Resources Defense Council, was the chair of President Carter's Council on Environmental Quality, and was founder and president of the World Resources Institute. He also was professor of law at Georgetown University. From 1993 until 1999, when he joined Yale's Forestry School, Dr. Speth served as the administrator of the United Nations Development Program and the chair of the UN Development Group. His numerous awards include the National Wildlife Federation's Resources Defense Award, the National Resources Council of America's Barbara Swain Honor, Award of Honor, a Special Recognition Award from the Society for International Development, the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Environmental Law Institute, and Japan's Blue Planet Prize. He's the author of Red Sky at Morning, and more recently, as we'll hear tonight, The Bridge at the Edge of the World, Capitalism, the Environment, and Crossing from Crisis to Sustainability. Joining Dr. Speth tonight is Eric Rostin, an acclaimed science journalist. Mr. Rostin currently is senior associate in the Washington, D.C. office of the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions of Duke University. Previously a reporter with Time Magazine, Mr. Rostin covered economics, climate, technology, and politics for many years, including in-depth analyses of the 2004 presidential election and eyewitness accounts of the New York events of 9-11. For that work, he was part of a reporting team that won a National Magazine Award for Best Single Issue Coverage. A graduate of Columbia University, where he received both bachelor's and master's degrees in history, Eric is an advisory board member of Clear Standards Incorporated and a frequent guest on national news programs and internet blog sites. His recent book, which we'll hear about tonight, The Carbon Age, How Life's Core Element Has Become Civilization's Greatest Threat, shows us that the environmental challenges we face are deeply entwined with the path of carbon as it cycles between Earth's atmosphere, biosphere, and oceans. So again, welcome, and we look forward to what I'm sure will be a very spirited discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meserve. Thank you, Dr. Light. Thanks to Gus Beth for being here this evening. Uh, I've come to this auditorium many times, and it's a privilege to be sitting on this side of the seat. And when we come to this auditorium, we often uh, expect to hear the, n the hottest new thing, the cutting edge of science, uh, the tip of the spear. Science is a drive into the unknown, and every step into that unknown is a step toward greater specialization in all of our various areas of knowledge. I'd like to start with uh, sort of excusing myself for running in the opposite direction tonight, is I'm arguing uh, against specialization. I, uh, this is a quote I came across uh, by Buckminster Fuller the architect and futurist, and uh, sometimes eloquent, sometimes garble-mouthed uh, writer. He wrote in his book, uh, An Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth, all universities have been progressively organized for ever finer specialization. Society assumes that specialization is natural, inevitable, and desirable. Yet in observing a little child, we find it is interested in everything and spontaneously apprehends 
comprehends and coordinates an ever-expanding inventory of experiences. Children are enthusiastic planetarium audiences. Nothing seems to be more prominent about human life than its wanting to understand all and put everything together. About five years ago, I embarked on what was initially an extremely naive uh, attempt to understand all and put everything together. This adventure was launched by two naive questions. One of them was, why is everyone talking about carbon all the time and nobody knows what it is? Uh, we were talking about carbon in climate change, carbon dioxide. We were talking about carbon in uh, the steady rise of oil prices, and, uh, the, the, our addiction to, to hydrocarbons. We talked about carbon in Lance Armstrong's $6,500 uh, dollar carbon fiber bicycle, in new Airbus and Boeing airplanes. Everywhere you looked, the word carbon came up in all these stovepipe stories we talked about. So that was one question. The other question was, why is climate change treated as an environmental issue? So I'd like to talk about, uh, just for a couple minutes, uh, about each of these questions and the answers I sketched out for them. I'll hand it off for Dr. Speth, uh, and then we will uh, open it up for some Q&A. So why is it that we talk about carbon all the time and nobody knows what it is? And uh, if you want to talk about carbon, there are any of a number of paths to get into the conversation. You can talk about what you had for lunch. You can talk about the fibers in the seats you're sitting, in, uh, you're sitting on. You can talk about climate change. You can talk about oil prices. Uh, but given this breadth of things to talk about, why not start with Alfred Hitchcock? Uh, the films of Alfred Hitchcock are motivated by a device that is useful for thinking about uh, education and, and, our, and media at this point in our history. And if anyone's uh, a fan of Alfred Hitchcock, you know that the movies are motivated by what he called the MacGuffin. Uh, and the MacGuffin is the spy papers or the uranium and the wine bottles. It never really mattered what the MacGuffin is. The only thing that matters is that the characters really cared a lot about what uh, they were after. And even if you've seen a Hitchcock movie, you don't know, you may not remember uh, what the actual MacGuffin was. Uh, and Hitchcock said in an interview in the early 60s, he said, the only thing that really matters is that in, this, in the film, the plans, the documents, or the secrets must seem to be of vital importance to the characters. To me, the narrator, they're of no importance whatsoever. So when you look at our media landscape and you look at all the stovepipe places we talk about carbon, or you look at social security policy, or you look at banking policy, or the absence thereof, or energy policy, everything is about the chase. Everything is about suspense and who's going to win and who's not. <clears throat> so I wanted to, I wanted more than a MacGuffin. Uh, and carbon being the core structural element of all life and civilization, seemed like something you don't necessarily want to uh, continue to treat as a MacGuffin. And I, I did an enormous amount of research, uh, a lot of travels. I went to Houston and interviewed uh, a founder of the nanotechnology movement. I went to Waterloo, Wisconsin, where they make Lance Armstrong's bicycles. Uh, I went to Mars. Uh, I was at the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, and I was interviewing the mission director of something called the Ar Orbiting Carbon Observatory of NASA. And at the end of the interview, he said, do you want to see the Mars room? And who wouldn't want to see the Mars room? So, uh, so I saw Mars for what it's worth, and that's just where they house the two uh, twins of the rovers that are currently on Mars. So out of all this research uh, came a simple conclusion, which is, the carbon atom is the fastest way to learn the most about who we are and what life is and how industry emerged from it. And I, feel, I felt a little bit conned by science. Uh, and Dr. Meserve talked about this a little bit in his introduction, that we think about science the way scientists do, or at least we're taught to. Uh, and that's counterproductive, I think, because for me, for perhaps many people in the audience, it doesn't matter what... Uh, the differences between geochemistry or biogeochemistry or paleobiogeochemistry. As I went through my research, I decided to dismantle these categories, and I ended up with this big box, and I called this big box carbon science. And what happened when I peered into that box is I saw that all the dynamism that's missing from these stovepipe categories 
uh, was suddenly present and, and viable and exciting. Uh, and I figured that is a, uh, that's a new way to think about science. It's a new way to think about the challenges and opportunities we face in this century. So what does that leave you with? Well, here's one thing it leaves you with, uh, is uh, there was a, a, a teaser to a, a magazine section a couple years ago, a teaser news industry jargon for, uh, you know, so the, the question on the front of the magazine that gets you inside, and this teaser was, uh, guess what the hottest new crop of science books is? And here's a hint, it's not geology. A perfectly fine teaser, did the job, got me in the magazine, and it was a review of Freakonomics and uh, Confessions of a hit, Economic Hitman and a number of the other uh, economics books that came out a couple years ago. And it was a great teaser. The only thing is that's wholly, wholly messed up. Uh, the fact that uh, we have been unearthing carbon minerals for 200 years and burning them into atmospheric gas and not calling that geology, call it economics. Uh, and that was a uh, sort of one moment I had in terms of, uh, you know, how can we get, not only how can we s sort of smash the disciplines of history, how can we, of, of science, how can we integrate science and history into the same conversation? Uh, a, another thing that you might think of uh, when you put those two ideas together is that the energy industry isn't really the energy industry, is it? The energy industry is also the matter industry because uh, it turns out, even though we've been enjoying the benefits of energy which, which, uh, retrieved from fossil fuels, it turns out the matter is a big part, unearthing these carbon minerals and turning them into atmospheric gas. It turns out that the matter matters. Uh, so in the book, I try to bring to uh, life a little bit, uh, I try to integrate history and science in a new way. You can do this uh, in terms of the study of plausible, orange, excuse me, plausible origins of life. Uh, and this is one area where the Carnegie Institution is one of the premier uh, research uh, groups in the world. And it's actually worth pointing out that this book probably would not exist, at least in this form, without an enormous amount of uh, research from the Carnegie, both archival and recent. It's no surprise that living things consume energy and organic materials, but that's a very life-centric way of thinking about the problem. In searching for life's origins, few seem to take the Earth's needs explicitly into account. What if life is the result of an early Earth bathed in energy with limited ways to degrade it and radiate it back out to space? For analogies, scientists look elsewhere in nature where energy channels relax disparities in conditions such as air pressure or electrical change. A lightning bolt channels electricity from the upper atmosphere to the ground. Temperature and pressure gradients uh, create a channel of water and air by swirling into a hurricane. Perhaps life also began by exploiting differences in energy, creating a channel between carbon dioxide, the carbon compound with the lowest energy, and methane, which has the highest energy. Life could be Earth's way of restoring equilibrium between high and low energy molecules. So that's going pretty far back. Uh, and you can apply that same paradigm to issues we currently face. And I'll hand it over to Gus here in a second. I, uh, if you've, uh, many of you, except probably all but one or two of you have not seen my basement, uh, which is filled with stacks and stacks of paper. Uh, the grist for this book was probably about 2,000 or so peer-reviewed journal articles. One night I got so frustrated looking at them, I was just like, how would I, how would I say this all in two sentences? So here we go. The changes wrought by global warming threaten the extent and potential of modernity. Only a nuclear war or drug-resistant pathogen can compete with global warming as civilization's greatest threat. The simplest and most scientifically sound description of anthropogenic global warming can be summarized in two sentences. One, temperature and atmospheric carbon are coupled on every geological time scale, usually with temperature leading, but not since industrialization. Two, humans are burning carbon minerals into atmospheric gas at least 100 times faster than the Earth's usual rate 
heating and transforming the planet. Together, these two statements challenge the current meaning of the phrase geologic timescale. Human speed has crunched the geologic timescale into half a century. Events that typically unfold over many thousands or millions of years have begun to occur within a single human lifespan. And uh, I apologize for reading sort of live from the book, but uh, live I'm not going to come up with something better than something I slaved over for a long time. Uh, so excuse that. Uh, so I, I started my comments with a quotation from Buckminster Fuller and talking about how we all need to be children again and we all need to see the big picture and take a step back uh, and look at our past in a new way. Uh, Gus is going to give us a look at where we are currently uh, and what the, what the future holds. And in this future, we have to be grown-ups as well as, as children because global warming is a very grown-up problem. Hi. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Eric. Eric has written a really wonderful uh, book. I, I encourage you to actually buy it uh, and certainly uh, read it uh, somehow because it, it's full of marvelous uh, uh, scientific uh, vignettes uh, uh, stated and, and, and written in a way that uh, is very accessible to, to non-scientists and, and lay people. Uh, it's a wonderful book, and I've enjoyed reading it twice now. Um, I want to talk about the, uh, the, the climate issue, our immediate uh, carbon problem, uh, and begin really by reminding you what uh, Sir David King recently was the chief scientist in the United Kingdom government uh, said, which was that this is the most serious issue uh, facing humanity today. Uh, more serious than terrorism, uh, more serious than uh, credit, uh, the most serious issue we face. And then along came uh, Sir Nicholas uh, Stern and in his economic way said that this was the biggest market failure that uh, he had ever, uh, possible uh, had happened. Only an economist would describe the climate crisis as a market failure. Uh, but uh, uh, here's, uh, here's what uh, uh, Sir Gus uh, thinks about it. Um, I would say that, that the climate issue is uh, also uh, our, our greatest failure in science communication. And I want to develop that just a little bit uh, with you. And I'll begin by telling a story, uh, some of which uh, Dick might remember because we were in the Carter administration together uh, when this story uh, came up. Um, it's, uh, it's about the day that the carbon atom uh, really entered my life. Uh, it probably should have entered my life when I was taking organic chemistry at Yale, but, uh, <laughs> but I don't think it really did. But I was, uh, here is that day, I was minding my own business in my office, but I had agreed to meet uh, with a, a, a group of scientists uh, and uh, they came in and they said, you've got to take this issue to the president. It was 1979. Uh, I was chairman of the Council on Environmental Quality. You've got to take this issue to the president. I, I, I said, what issue? They said, uh, the carbon dioxide problem and the climate threat, the threat to climate. And I hadn't, didn't know much about it. I think a man named Kellogg had written a book that I'd seen, and Manabi had done some research. There was a good bit of stuff that had been done by that time, but it was not an issue uh, that the public or even the chairman of CEQ was very aware of. So I said, well, do you need to get me a report uh, on this issue that I can take to the president? And um, so it landed on my desk uh, very shortly thereafter. And there were the names of the most famous people you know, the, it was a report by the group that had come to see me, uh, Roger Ravel, uh, David Keeling, Gordon McDonnell, and George Woodwell. And uh, Eric t tells a story in his book about how uh, Ravel encouraged Keeling to go do the uh, famous measurements of the CO2 buildup uh, in Hawaii and the discussions that led to this 
most famous of all probably uh, uh, scientific graphs of uh, the rise of CO2 going constantly up uh, over the decades uh, since 1958 when Keeling started during those measurements. So I had this report and um, I uh, took it to the president and, and I said, you know, I've talked with him about it. He expressed concern, but he did the, the right thing. He passed the report on to Frank Press uh, in the office of, uh, of President Science Office, uh, where Dick was working at the time. And Frank Press uh, forwarded, on, forwarded on to the National Academy of Sciences. And the National Academy had also been forwarded another report by that somewhat mysterious group uh, called the Jasons. Uh, on this issue earlier. And uh, the combination got them to ask an uh, MIT scientist named Jewel Charney to do a report, which came out in late 1979, uh, called the Charney Report. It was a National Academy of Sciences report. And um, it uh, really said in 1979 everything we needed to know to begin to take this issue very, very seriously as a matter of policy and not simply as a matter of scientific investigation. So for essentially 30 years, uh, we've known that we had to take this issue very seriously. And um, uh, Eric also relates some research by two of my Yale colleagues, Bruner uh, and Jeff Park, uh, in which they have indicated, uh, looking back over hundreds of millions of years of the climate record, that a doubling of CO2 in the atmosphere should increase the global average temperature by about 2.8 degrees Celsius. So let's say three degrees. So what did the Charney report say in 1979 was the midpoint of their range that the doubling of CO2 in the atmosphere would cause terms of temperature increase, three degrees. So we knew in 1979 approximately the, the, say, the, the, the right number of what could happen with the buildup of this CO2, now confirmed uh, recently by the most thorough type of research that you can have and enshrined also in the IPCC uh, report. Um, we then issued uh, three reports in the latter days of the Carter administration calling for action on this issue. One of them, the somewhat famous Global 2000 report. Uh, and, 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 and my last press conference as a chairman of CEQ, which was dutifully reported by that wonderful New York Times journalist, Philip Shabakov, um, was to call for agreement in, in our country and others that we not allow the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere to build up more than 50% over the pre-industrial level. Now, 50% over the pre-industrial level uh, is about 420 parts per million um, and would be a, a very uh, aggressive a climate goal if we were to set it today. At that time, it seemed quite uh, plausible uh, that, that we could, we, we didn't know exactly why we picked that number, to be honest, but we picked it because we had looked hard at what this three degrees, as hard as we could, a possibility of a three degrees Celsius global average warming would do uh, to the planet. And so we wanted some number that was significantly below that as the cap that we would encourage. Uh, and so even back then, we knew we had to have an aggressive goal to be set, a, a numerical goal that should be set. And of course, we're still arguing uh, about that. And, and it wasn't just our report that came out then. Since that time, there's been a, several other major National Academy reports uh, by the mid-1980s, uh, the New York Times was editorializing uh, for climate action. By the mid-1980s. Uh, and, and since then, of course, and then recently, there's just been an avalanche of information uh, coming out. And meanwhile, 
uh, essentially nothing has been done. I mean, there's been a lot of talk, and there are climate agreements, and we hope we're on the verge of some of the things that are happening at the state level and hopefully at the federal level really having some impact on actually how many of these carbon molecules are getting into the atmosphere. But so far, I would say that, you know, to the degree there's been any reduction in, in emissions, it, it hasn't been due to the climate issue. It's been due to other things, efficiency gains and other possibilities of that type. So the result is that when Keeling measured the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, as Eric reports, in 1958, he had 313 parts per million of CO2. And today, we're up at, at what, 390 parts per million CO2? An increase in 25%, roughly, uh, during that 50 years. So we've had 50 years since the best scientists sort of thought that this was a serious issue and should be examined. Uh, and 30 years since we absolutely knew it had to be addressed. And, uh, and meanwhile, the carbon dioxide concentration has gone up 25%. Uh, and what have we done? Uh, and, and so I think there's an enormous uh, failure of communicating science here. Enormous failure. Uh, and, uh, and it's no accident that people are getting very frustrated and our biggest champion of action, Al Gore, just yesterday, or the day before, uh, basically said, and I don't want to quote him, so you better read what he said yourselves, but uh, that he thought it would be appropriate uh, if there were actually civil disobedience to stop the construction of some of the new coal-fired power plants. This was at the Clinton Global Initiative meeting and uh, I'm, the, the New York Times reported that Clinton immediately moved on to another topic. Uh, the, um, and in the meanwhile, while the emissions have continued to go up and the science is flooding, uh, and it's very disturbing if you follow these reports of what's going on, um, the uh, estimate of what we need to do in terms of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions to a, a safe level, a non-dangerous level under the climate treaty have gone down dramatically. The European Union once thought that it would be good to, just to stop the buildup at a point which allowed temperatures to rise no more than two degrees Celsius. And they associated that with 550 parts per million, roughly the doubling. Well, it turned out that was wrong and, uh, and, and was too generous uh, to the emitters. So people moved to 450 parts per million a as a goal, uh, something more like what we were recommending 30 years ago. And, but now, the people who've looked hardest at this issue realize that we probably are already at about two degrees in terms of long-term commitment uh, that's pretty much what the IPCC says. And that uh, we have to stop at less than two degrees. Uh, Jim Hansen being the most prominent proponent of this idea that if we get to two degrees or more, we could create a self-reinforcing process of, of warming. Wouldn't need any more emissions at that point to have additional warming. Um, and so, there, uh, we now have people uh, campaigning for capping emissions at 350 parts per million, which is problematic since we're already at 390. Uh, and, and so we need to sort of cl cleanse the atmosphere. Uh, so this calls for, would call for even more dramatic action than anyone is contemplating in the political process now and also major efforts to plant trees and perhaps do other things uh, that would scrub our atmosphere. So what we have is a not pretty picture. Uh, and, and, and as I say, a, 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 an unprecedented failure of communicating science. And I don't think it's because the scientists have sat on their hands. Uh, perhaps they should have been more uh, engaged at one time or another 
in the process. Uh, perhaps we all should have been. Uh, but there have been uh, uh, the academies of our country and other country and scientific groups have been flooding us with desperate pleas. I think this is one issue where the scientists really believe that they are, they, they normally think the environmentalists are a little extreme and, and a little off from where they want to be or should be. But in this particular case, I, I think it's fair that the scientists think that the environmentalists aren't radical enough uh, on the issue. And um, so it's interesting to you know, ask why. How did this happen? How could this happen? How could we get to the point that we're on the cusp of ruining the planet? And, uh, and it's a very good question. And I, uh, I'm sure that you have your own thoughts about that. Um, the, uh, some say the issue is so complex. Well, you know, in a sense it's not. And in its core, it's not any more complex than the chlorofluorocarbons attacking the ozone layer, is it? And yet we really acted on that issue. Um, some would say that um, it's not a crisis uh, and we really only respond to, to crises. And I think there's something to that. We're seeing crises occur. If you're an Inuit uh, living on the coast of Alaska, you know it's a crisis. Um, but it's also true that in a way uh, the chlorofluorocarbon issue uh, wasn't a crisis in the, the big sense. It did have the effect of scaring people about skin cancer and, uh, and making people put on a lot of lotions and things. So it was, it was different. So that, I would, you know, say was, but it still to strikes me that that doesn't really explain it. Uh, some people say, that, well, there's been a tremendous disinformation campaign uh, to confuse people about the science on the climate issue. And, and I think that's, that's true. Uh, there has been. Uh, but, um, you know, for a long time there was a total denial on the CFC ozone depletion link, uh, led by the very people uh, who were producing it, of course. Um, so what happened on chlorofluorocarbons is that the industry turned around. It, it, DuPont actually ended up wanting to have CFCs uh, regulated because they had an alternative chemical that they wanted to sell uh, that could replace the CFCs happens to be a greenhouse gas, but that's another story. Uh, and so basically there wasn't, in the end, a kind of industry opposition to it. And I think there are other differences, but to me the biggest issue, the biggest difference between these two cases, one of action and one of inaction, uh, is that the climate issue is an energy issue. And the energy is at the core of our modern political economy uh, is, as we've all heard, the lifeblood uh, of the economy. It's central to our lifestyles. Um, it, it's represented in our politics by not a couple of companies who happen to have an alternative they can produce, but it's represented in our politics by enormous political clout. And uh, and it's a vast source of profit. Uh, and so it, it really, we haven't been able to do anything much about our energy policy in this country uh, for a long time. And, and, and it's, so I think that, you know, a, rep, a vice president from BP was speaking at Yale not too long ago and he pointed out that, you know, they really don't anticipate making anything like the kind of money out of their investment that they put into BP solar that, that they make out of oil. That the real profit is, is, in, um, is in extraction and, and, and processing of, of the gasoline. Uh, and so I think this, uh, we've been caught in this system that in fact has, this system of political economy that in fact has uh, determined so much of our 
the outcome on, on not just this environmental issue, but on really the whole environmental issue uh, writ large. And, and that is, was one reason I, I wrote this new book. Uh, I tried to address a paradox. And how could the environmental community get stronger and more sophisticated uh, in our country with vastly more money and members and activity and groups, and yet the environment continue to go downhill? To go downhill to the point that we're really on the cusp of ruining the planet. If we just keep producing greenhouse gases at current rates, just keep destroying impoverishing ecosystems at current rates, uh, just keep releasing toxics at current rates, that place won't be fit to live in for our grandchildren in the latter part of this century. And now that I have two grandchildren, I really think about them in this context uh, a lot. And, but of course, we're not just going to keep doing what we're doing, right? Uh, we now uh, are faced with the prospect of a quadrupling of the world economy by the time those grandchildren get to be 50. Quadrupling of the economic activity. It took all of history to grow the $7 trillion economy that was on this planet when I was a kid, eight years old, 1950. How long does it take to add another $7 trillion of output to the world economy today? All of history to get to 1950. Less than a decade. The doubling time of the world economy now is somewhere between 15 and 20 years, depending on whether you pick a 5% rate or a 4% rate or something like that. And so what we have, I mean, right at the time when we should be undoing all these trends, we are faced with the prospect of dramatic escalation of all these releases, of all these problems. And uh, so what I tried to do in the book is to explain what was the system of political economy in which we were operating. This system, you know, we always thought somehow in the back of our minds, and I, I suspect you have too, that somehow the environmental community starting small and weak would grow in strength and, and uh, it was like swimming against a current. And, and at first we couldn't make it against that current, but just keep doing what we're doing, just try harder, get bigger, push harder, talk more, try to get more action, and somehow we'd prevail against that current and start making real progress against it. And that's the mental image that I had in my head for 40 years. And so I asked myself recently, does that really what has happened? And it isn't what has happened. I mean, we're losing 6,000 acres a day of open space in the United States. 100,000 acres of wetlands a year. The Bush administration tried to camouflage that by counting farm ponds as wetlands and therefore claimed that there was no net loss of wetlands during the one period of time a couple of years ago. Uh, but we are, we're losing, and uh, you know, we set these goals in the Clean Water Act in 1972. By 1983, we were supposed to have fishable and swimmable waters in the United States, by 1983. But today, a third of the streams and half the lakes still don't meet the fishable and swimmable standard. And we have huge air, condition, or air pollution problems, which would look a lot worse if EPA would set the ozone standard and the particulate standards at the right level. So we just, you know, we really are, still swimming upstream and drifting away uh, with the current. So I had to ask myself, you know, what is it going to take to prevail against this current? We've got to step out of that stream. We've got to do something other than always swimming against it, in other words. And, and, and my conclusion came out sort of radical, which was that it really is this system of political economy that we call capitalism today not the capitalism of the textbook or some idealized system, but this raw system of political economy that you know, we live with in our nation's capital and in our lives uh, every day. And you know, that system puts a first premium on continued growth both at the firm level and at the national level. It stimulates and depends upon a runaway consumerism that we're mostly all guilty of. Uh, it invests uh, a corporations with enormous uh, political and economic power. 
I would say corporations have been known for a long time as the principal economic actors in our system, but today they are the principal political actors as well. And we have this growth fetish, we have this runaway consumerism, we have this enormous setup, a structure for corporate power, which is, you know, enshrined in the charter, in, by the failure of the whole chartering process and the, and, the, and the gift to the corporate community of personhood under the Constitution, uh, which, and, and, um, and this system is, uh, you know, is, is driven by a profit motive. The profits are dependent on not paying for those environmental externalities, the cost that the companies run up, is dependent on the routine deployment of technology that was designed and invented before there was any concern about the environment. There's a lot more profit there. And is dependent on deep gifts from government, which they routinely strive to get and do, as we're seeing. Uh, and so basically, my conclusion in this book is, after I go through all this, is that we've got to change the system. Um, we won't succeed uh, by working within the system when what we need is the transformation of the system itself. And of course, that doesn't mean socialism or state socialism, but it does mean moving beyond the capitalism that we have today to look for an alternative to today's capitalism. And if the book does nothing else other than to begin to legitimize discussions uh, about these issues uh, in some quarters, I, I, I will, will be happy. If we begin to think seriously about what a post-growth society would look like, uh, if we begin to think seriously about how we could redesign the modern corporation to focus on servicing all the stakeholders and not just the stockholders and other things. If we could begin to question the values that dominate in our culture and our hyperventilating lifestyles and, and runaway consumerism. We really need to legitimize discussion of these issues and to take them up and because we will not prevail against that current uh, because it gets stronger than we do. It grows in strength and size and complexity and treacherousness faster than we can get stronger and more sophisticated ourselves. And as long as we just keep doing what we're doing, it's not like that New Yorker cartoon where the penguin uh, was flying away from the others who was sitting there on the ice and, and he turned around and said, see, we just haven't been flapping hard enough. And, you know, we have been flapping harder and harder. And, uh, and so we need to question these, these basic things about our society and, uh, and, and raise these, these basic issues about, you know, what's it all about. The positive psychologists have told us now umpteen times that, you know, that all this growth, all this getting and spending is not really making us any happier. It's not improving our sense of satisfaction with life. Once you get beyond ten, twelve thousand dollars per capita income, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, so we're destroying the environment. We probably have what Herman Daly calls uneconomic growth. Great phrase. Uneconomic growth, where somehow if you could actually account all the damages to people, to communities, uh, to our society, to the natural world, occasioned by increments of growth that would probably outweigh the benefits that we get at this point. Now that's certainly not true of the developing world where much of the world needs a lot of growth, to, but uh, of the right kind. But in our country, uh, you know, it's time to rethink things, I think. Um, so that, that's the message of the book, and um, they are, uh, there's, there's still a few to be sold, I think, in the bookstores. Uh, <laughs> well, but, the, uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to. I was going to point out that after your questions, we'll be outside signing and <laughs> chatting. But I, I, I felt, you know, I felt sort of a, a pyrrhic victory when I uh, 
you know, when I think about the fact, well, somehow we knew 30 years ago, there's a certain perverse satisfaction, right, in, uh, in, in thinking that, you know, well, you know, at least we had it right 30 years ago. But, um, but I really didn't appreciate that there were other people who had it right 50 years ago to this year. So if we could uh, roll the film, anybody remember Frank Baxter, who did a lot of uh, science education uh, film, and Frank uh, Capra? Can we roll the film? Our man is taking a break up there. He's not there anymore. <laughs> this is uh, uh, this is a 19, clip from a 1958 educational film called The Unchained Goddess, produced by Frank Capra, who directed It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, apparently, okay. you can still buy a copy of this on Amazon, <laughs> because we may not see it tonight. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I see him now. Hi. We're ready. Yeah. Right, we're we're writing a report about the. Here we are. Audio visual stuff go. never works, does it? Extremely dangerous questions. Because with our present knowledge, we have no idea what would happen. Even now, man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. Due to our release through factories and automobiles every year of more than six billion tons of carbon dioxide, which helps air absorb heat from the sun, our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. This is bad. Well, it's been calculated a few degrees rise in the Earth's temperature would melt the polar ice caps. And if this happens, an inland sea would fill a good portion of the Mississippi Valley. Tourists in glass-bottomed boats would be viewing the drowned towers of Miami through 150 feet of tropical water. Foreign weather, we're not only dealing with forces of a far greater variety than even the atomic physicist encounters, but with life itself. Amazing, huh? We'd like to ask people to ask questions, uh, if you have any. We, uh, we ask that if you keep your questions concise, we will keep our answers concise. Uh, my name's John okay. Mickey. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. My name's John Mickey. I've done, uh, as probably some of us have, some modeling of myself of projecting down the road. Given the momentum that you talked about, coupled with the high population, coupled with existing easy-to-get-at fossil fuel reserves, and I don't see how we can avoid a cataclysmic drop in population over the next 100 years, particularly when you take into account the huge industrial base as well as economic base would have to be changed in the U.S. and Western Europe and in the developing countries to bring it into some reasonable, sustainable line. If that is at all reasonable, uh, a prediction, then doesn't it make sense, this is one of the unthinkable things, doesn't it make sense for the United States, which has enormous assets of money, engineering talent, and so forth, Had to start thinking about protecting ourselves in the next 30 or 40 years, and not cut off the rest of the, of the world, but mainly aim at protecting ourselves and our citizens. I, uh, I think there's a couple of reactions I have. One is the central question of climate change to a lot of people is, what does the current generation owe the future? And that's a question that is hard to answer, even though we basically answered it, uh, the answer being not much. Um, but it's helpful to keep that in mind because that's what frames our responses uh, as individuals, as 
communities, as nations, as, and as an international economy. Predictions are, uh, prediction of the uh, is very difficult, particularly of the future. And uh, we, as I, as I said at the end of my remarks, this is a very grown up issue. One of the most grown up issues we have. And we can't say with specificity what's gonna happen or when it's gonna happen. Uh, and some people will argue we shouldn't do anything because the train has left the station. But as Jay Hakes uh, recently wrote in a book called The Declaration of Energy Independence, uh, there are many more trains poised to leave the station. So the answer, I think, is to, uh, this is an all-hands-on-deck affair from individual households to the international economy. And as ridiculous a thing as that is to say, uh, it's not as ridiculous as things that are predicted to happen. Yeah, I would I would say that we uh, that you know there's there is a um, I don't know that if this is exactly what you're suggesting, but uh, but I think there will be uh, a tendency to to go to what might be called fortress world uh, that the scenario builders refer to it, uh, and um, and I it seems to me that that's not the right direction to say the least. Uh, I mean, first, we, uh, we already know that uh, China's emissions of greenhouse gases exceed ours. And, uh, and so we are all in this together. It's, a, it's one planetary environment, and we have a lot of people contributing to its deterioration. And it's going to take uh, unprecedented international cooperation to deal with these issues. Unprecedented. Uh, and it, it will be urgent. Uh, and before we, you know, solve these problems, we're going to uh, take some, some serious hits. Uh, but we'll be worse hits coming for future generations unless we have international cooperation to deal with these issues on an unprecedented scale. And the, the speaker mentioned the population issue at the outset. Uh, it's clearly a driver. The economy is an even bigger driver, uh, so to speak, uh, escalating uh, you know, times faster than the population, but, but uh, there is a huge international, there's both a domestic and an international population issue. Uh, we're severely fu underfunding international population programs today. Uh, we, we have a, uh, you know, we, there's a real, if we did the right things uh, with maternal and child health care, uh, family planning services, uh, empowerment of women, education of girls, uh, you know, we could, uh, really helped the world stabilize uh, populations and had hopefully, uh, you know, something around 9 billion. But it's going to take a much bigger effort than we're mounting today uh, to do that. And, uh, and so that's a serious challenge to our international cooperation issues. Also, it's worth pointing out that uh, aggressive international efforts are picking up steam now. And I, I don't want to if you, if you stay siloed in, in the science of climate change, it's easy to uh, get a little down. But toward the end of next year, we're going to see a lot of activity uh, as the world heads toward the next meeting of the COP nations in Copenhagen, where, with any luck and an enormous amount of work, we'll emerge from that with uh, a framework to succeed and that will be more successful than the Kyoto Protocol. Just to mention also, lest we take ourselves off the hook, I think the absolute numbers, in absolute numbers, if not percentage rates, U.S. population growth is second only to China. Hmm. I think that's the case. Anybody want to correct me? Uh, hmm? No, it's it's only about, as I, I may have my figures wrong, I. I'm no expert on this, but I think it's only, uh, it's about half and half. Half natural increase and, and half immigration. Good evening. My name's David. I'm uh, sorry. Did I say China? You did. I did. I'm sorry. I meant India. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My, my name's David. Uh, I'm a scientist, and I was working at the National Academy of Sciences in the early 80s and met Roger Ravel and became convinced that global warming was the biggest challenge to humanity in spite of the fact that the following winter was particularly cold. <laughs> that experience didn't change my understanding of the problem. 
you said that it was a failure, or you suggested it was a huge failure of science to communicate. But communication's a two-way street. No, I didn't, I didn't actually say what it was a failure of the scientists to communicate. I said it was a failure of science communication. Okay, the failure of science communication. Yes. But communication is a two-way street. And as you know, for many people, science is like Greek to me. Could it be that it's also a failure to educate in science? I wouldn't draw a distinction between what the media has to do and what educators have to do. And we're in an impoverished educational and media environment at the moment. Uh, so uh, books like, like ours, in some ways, and I can't decide if I'm actually going to say this out loud, uh, but they're sort of band-aids for failed education. Uh, this book, my book, is a result of a complete and utter failure of science education. I am not a scientist, and uh, I'm embarrassed to say how little I knew before I began this years-long project. Well, there's a, there's a good story uh, that I can relate about environmental education, uh, which would you know, overlap with science education, which is that we had, and when we started the sort of, you know, working in environment in 1970 and had this burst of action, that was a very clear idea that, that so many of us had, that the issues were so urgent that we really didn't have time to educate a lot of people, that education was a long-term process, that it would take decades to get back, you know, before those school children would get to be adults, uh, and, and it's been severely neglected for decades. Uh, and as a result, here we are, they're adults now, and, and people have done a lot of polling of the American public on the, of their of, you know, knowledge of science and knowledge of environmental issues, knowledge of energy issues, and it really is sad. It's, uh, it's probably worth pointing out just quickly, it, one theme I brought up was the compartmentalized Compartmentalization of science, well, everything else gets compartmentalized too. Our high school classes and our newspaper sections and our congressional committees. One congressional committee, perhaps uh, in greater need of being updated, is the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pension uh, Committee. All those four things overseen by one committee, which is abbreviated HELP. And we're not going to uh, have, uh, be able to grow an economy as strong as we've seen a generation hence with the mentality that this is something that is health rather than some, this is investing in human capital as a way of, of continuing our, uh, our strength. Quick uh, comment and then I had a question. Uh, Dr. Smith, you talked about needing to think about new models of, of growth and possibilities of moving away from capitalism to do that. And I took a class last semester from, uh, from Herman Daly, and we obviously talked a lot about that issue. And instead of, in lieu of moving away from capitalism, at least what I took away from the class was one of the things that he focuses on is, is moving away from a consumption-based growth, measuring growth through consumption, to which is obviously what we do today and have done for the last 80 or 90 years. Um, to moving towards looking at growth in terms of quality improvements. So instead of a quantity-based growth schedule, looking at a quality-based growth schedule, which I think actually makes a lot of sense. And that doesn't require us to move away from capitalism, which as an economist I don't really think is a good idea. Um, it all depends on what you mean by capitalism. Uh, you know, in some, I, I don't, in the book I go into some, some detail, but I, I don't think we need to, uh, you know, the, the market, uh, using the market is, uh, is very, uh, could, can be, you know, is very useful. Uh, we see that today uh, with all the, Time Magazine, the old favorite, uh, had a really gutsy piece on all the benefits uh, from $4 gas. Uh, you know, we complain a lot about it and it's hurting a lot of people in our country. Uh, but they cataloged in a prominent article the, so, uh, all the things, the good things that in fact were happening in addition to lacing uh, Exxon's pockets. Uh, but the, 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 the thing that, um, the point is that, you know, getting the prices right, using the market, very important. Uh, and, uh, and, and nobody's talking here about, uh, about you know, uh, stripping uh, private property out of the system or anything like that. 
What I said was that we need to move beyond today's capitalism, and I certainly agree with Herman that a big, you know, part of that is, is, is you know, is, is reducing the material throughput uh, through, through society and, and getting more and more quality uh, out, of, uh, out of our lives in, in any number of, uh, of ways. Exactly. Uh, interesting to note that today was actually the first carbon auction with uh, the regional greenhouse gas initiative and in includes Maryland and northeast states. So that was a good day for the combination of capitalism and the markets or and environment. My question, though, was which I mentioned or talked briefly with, uh, with Eric about prior to this is what the two of you think about T. Boone Pickens' plan for, for I mean, this is just a, an, an energy thing, but I... I have some difficulty. I, I recognize that our increased dependence on oil is bad. I've sort of come to the conclusion that clean coal isn't all that clean. Um, but when it comes, so T. Boone talks, yes, about this kind of solar belt and about the wind belt, but it's really about, for him, because where all of his money is tied up is in this natural gas. And so I'm curious what you think about a natural gas-based fuel economy and or the T. Boone plan in general or um, the uh, <clears throat> natural gas economy, just to bite off the last end first, is something that you, you hear about sometimes, usually followed up by the recognition of the volatility of natural gas prices. And several years ago, everybody was talking about hydrogen cars, and the presumption was that you get the hydrogen off of methane. And, but then that does some pretty crazy things to the price of methane and makes hydrogen sort of prices production of hydrogen, let alone all the infrastructure questions, uh, out of play. I, uh, I think the T. Boone Pickens story is, uh, you know, most probably, for one, it's a great story. Uh, and you get a lot of press if you have a great story and an oil man embracing uh, renewable power and an and end to oil is counterintuitive and exciting and spicy and it's, it's great copy. Uh, and that's not to undermine the nobility of, of what he's trying to do. Uh, and I, th when I think about it, I, I, I think of oil as, as just sort of a, a s very substantial part of the problem, but still only 25 or 30 percent of the problem is, is, is our transportation contribution to, uh, to CO2 emissions. So, you know, my reaction is that great. The more people are out there, the more influential they are, the more money they have to spend and direct. Uh, we need that, and we need that leadership. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, you have three things you've got to do technologically. Uh, one is to shift to lighter hydrocarbons. And, and that can be important. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that means, you know, getting off of coal Reducing oil and, and using more natural gas. And it certainly means avoiding uh, oil shales and, and tar sands, um, which are, you know, worse than coal if you look at the total energy situation. Uh, it, secondly, uh, shifting to renewables. And uh, thirdly, uh, efficiency. And, you know, I haven't heard much from Pickens about efficiency, but I really haven't read, honestly, anything you know, I haven't gone to the website. I've just listened to the commercials now many times. Uh, but, you know, I think that's the template against which you've got to judge what he's recommending. And if you look just at the commercials, uh, which stress, you know, getting onto natural gas and, uh, and, and using uh, a lot of wind, which he, by the way, is investing in very heavily, I'm told, uh, you know, it, it's, it's surprisingly good in a way to come in considering the source. What's an environmentalist to do? <laughs> Everyone loves renewable energy. Uh, uh, you got your solar power, you got your wind power, unless you're Ted Kennedy and you have a wind plant right in front of your house. You, everyone likes wind power. But we keep forgetting nuclear power, and I know environmentalists, some people say it's the clean energy, uh, but of course it's the problem where you gotta store that stuff and it never goes away, and there's the probability of an accident. Uh, how realistic is nuclear power for, in this equation? Is that something that environmentalists should endorse and say, look, let's hope we don't have an accident and this is going to be better than creating this carbon problem? What, what do you guys think about that? I think sure. 
Uh, the, and actually, one thing that's interesting is if you look at, uh, there's been a, this is obviously a constant theme in, in the environmental press. The, uh, some environmental groups have, have swapped uh, positions and now support nuclear because it doesn't produce carbon dioxide as a primary waste product uh, because its waste product is something you can measure and see and put in a box under Nevada if anybody lets you. Uh, and uh, what's interesting is that the, the impediment to nuclear now is economic. Uh, Finland just finished a new uh, nuclear plant that came in $6.66 billion above budget, meaning it cost a lot more than that. There is one company in the world, Japan Steelworks, that can make the forgings for a nuclear plant. They can do about four a year. Uh, so if we need, for example, according to a recent IEA report, something on the order of magnitude of 40 or 50 a year, you can see that for even just forgetting for a minute about the political problems, uh, the economic and production uh, issues are tremendous. And I'd uh, actually invite Dr. Meserve if he has any comments uh, on this, given his, uh, his background. But uh, Gus, what do you think? Well, uh, this is from someone who almost got fired in the Carter administration for proposing that we not build any more nuclear power plants until we had solved the waste disposal problem. I did that, and I was called on the carpet. But I thought I was on pretty safe ground, because actually Jimmy Carter had said that during the campaign. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but in any case, uh, I, I think we need to, to uh, re-engage with nuclear power. Um, I think it's a lot, it's very complicated. I don't have a lot of confidence in our and our Congress to, to, and others to do the right thing on this issue. We have a proliferation issue out there, which is uh, scary, and uh, and that's what I see as the main the main issue. But um, I I, uh, I wouldn't let uh, the safety issue. Uh, if I you know if we really could get the best people working on uh, on reactor types uh, and and, and give us the safest reactor type, and we really, uh, you know, went ahead with a, uh, a sophisticated program of, of waste management, which I'm not at all sure Yucca, Yucca Mountain is. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't stop it because of those, those concerns. So I think it's, it's, it's well worth reengaging uh, um, with, with, with the nuclear question. And if I had only one choice, to pick a, you know, modern uh, nuclear power plant or a coal-fired, dirty old coal-fired power plant uh, without without carbon capture and storage, and that was the, for a thousand megawatts, and that was the only choice that I had. I'd pick the nuclear plant, but fortunately, that's not the only choice that we have. We, you know, we have it had any national conversation to speak of about efficiency, which in the end I, I would predict is going to turn out to be the, by far the biggest contributor to uh, our energy uh, security and the climate issue solutions. Thanks. Well, I've certainly gone to that despair place. I also am, have more recently, in talking to my children, remembered that in terms of the education question, you can now post something on YouTube and reach hundreds of millions of people in 30 seconds, which was not possible 30 years ago or 50 years ago. I think that once we have political leaders who are used to electronic communications, we could have <laughs> things be very different than they are now and not have our political leaders advising us to shop as a coping strategy. And I'm interested to hear more about what you think we can do in 
because we now have this new structure. A hundred years ago, we didn't have automobiles and we didn't have highways. So a hundred years hence, we can easily have a society that is not built around automobiles and highways. We can also do a hundred other things. We just need the ideas. We need the political will to do them. So what do you guys think we can do to take the tool that now exists in the internet and that mass communication and use it to our advantage? Well, my first reaction is uh, the, the downside, of course, is that in the same 30 seconds that you upload uh, a, a video of great merit, 300 million people can uh, upload videos of dropping menthos in uh, Diet Coke. Uh, so there's uh, leadership is obviously the key issue there because you need to direct people to quality material and you need to cut through the noise. Uh, another reaction I had to lapse into tech policy for a second is to keep the internet free uh, and to make sure that it remains as it was created, um, uh, the web in particular, a medium for the free exchange of ideas, particularly among researchers and educators. Uh, and my, my third comment would be that, uh, sort of in reference to the carbon age actually, is I didn't use the web for research at all or virtually uh, at all. Uh, but I, did, I didn't use Google, but I used Google Scholar. And Google Scholar is a window into the entire world of peer-reviewed articles, uh, which this book is based on. So in, I would draw a strong line between the wild uh, west of the internet and the fact that it's the easiest way, that professional literature has never been this democratic. Uh, and that is something we can all take advantage of. I, I agree with this, with the point the speaker made very much. And I, I think there's uh, just uh, to give two examples uh, from one is uh, if you haven't done it, check out the story of stuff, uh, oh, yes. which is a perfectly marvelous uh, short uh, YouTube uh, item by Annie Leonard. I had a chance to meet with the other day. Uh, and uh, it, it is spectacular. And I pointed out to her the one fact that she didn't use, I don't think it's in there, is that you know we've had to create this self-storage industry in the US. And if you uh, added up the square footage of all the self-storage in the US, it would now cover the entire island of Manhattan and the city of San Francisco combined. Would the uh, rest of America care? <laughs> that's, well, that's, that's a good question, too. Uh, but there's just, you know, it, it really is, it starts out about stuff, uh, but it really grows into more profound issues, and she does a beautiful job, and it's been seen by millions and millions of people now. Uh, so it's really fabulous to see that type of uh, education happening on the Internet. And secondly, uh, I don't know, perhaps you've done this, but I participated in a, uh, in a uh, move on, um, party uh, f for folks who were making calls for one of the senators uh, who's running for president. Uh, and uh, the beginning of the party was uh, this uh, telecommunication uh, that came in uh, that uh, on our computers from uh, sort of uh, uh, move on central. Uh, and uh, the whole thing was computerized. Uh, it was just uh, so it is a, and, and that's you know the background to to the Obama machine uh, and fundraising and all that. So it's a powerful organizing tool. So I think the answer is we, you know, from those two examples, we are seeing how to use this new tool, and, and it's just beginning. I I think oh. I'm next. Okay. Um, I'm Mitzi. I think so too. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Mitzi Wertheim, and I, I'm a social anthropologist by training, but I've been running for the last three and a half years an energy conversation, which is funded by the Defense Department, and it's energyconversation.org. Uh, it's open to everyone. We hold it at the Doubletree Hotel in Crystal City. Um, our first, and we cover the full spectrum. I mean, we've covered every aspect of energy. There are no single solutions. There are no silver bullets. We're going to need absolutely everything. When I got into this, I 
was sent an article by Walter Youngquist, who's written a, who wrote a brilliant book called Geodestinies. Um, unfortunately, it's out of print, and I'm not sure he's even alive, but he was working on a new one. And when I called him up, we talked about a whole variety of things. He said, Mitzi, the number one problem no one talks about, which is population. And he said, the dilemma is we have a planet that can support two and a half to three billion people in the way in which we want, and we are exhausting the resources. So even, and we, even if it's not the coal that we're using, we're exhausting the water. And this also gets back to your issue of waste and the way in which that's being done. So you can't think about these things in piece parts. You have to think about it as this gigantic system that we have to understand. And for people who are looking for one-off solutions, I mean, that's la-la land. Uh, um, I, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Gotcha. Well, when you, when you say we need all the energy sources, do you, I hope you mean all of the ones that are not contributing to climate change. Oh, no, I think that's absolutely right. And yeah. we need the technology, but I would make the argument the number one issue is not about the technology. It is about people, how they think, feel, and behave. And the issue there, of course, turns out to be leadership. I grew up during... World War II, and all of us felt a responsibility to the world in terms of what we were doing. We need to get back to thinking in those terms that all of us are a part of not well, only yeah, the I, problem, uh, but the if solution. I could hop in. Um, uh, one thing I would do to amend your statement uh, that uh, the world can only handle two, two and a half or three billion people, it's that the world can only handle uh, that many Americans. Uh, and it's the issue here isn't the number of people in general, it's the number of people who live like Americans uh, and our, our, our energy uses. In terms of uh, leadership, that's uh, absolutely the case. And one thing I say uh, and think about a lot is the fact that in the absence of leadership from the Oval Office, every one of us has to be the President of the United States on this issue. Uh, and every one of us has to organize not only our households, uh, not because there's any absolute gains there to be gained in the household. There's absolute gains in 300 million households. Uh, but we need to change the way we think, and we need to change the way beha we behave. Uh, and if one person in the Oval Office isn't going to do it, the other 300 million of us have to. Uh, and maybe I'll ask uh, Gus to no, I just think you're right. That, I mean, in this sense, uh, the, the people dimension has gotten is now, I think, the, where the critical action is in this sense. All of my life, the environmental discourse has been dominated by lawyers, by scientists, and by economists. And we have reached the point where we need to hear a lot more from the psychologists and the philosophers and the poets and the preachers and the psychiatrist. Uh, the, you know, the human dimension, the, the motivation issue, uh, what really makes people tick and how minds can be changed. Can we have a national conversion experience? Okay, I know we've got a couple more questions, but uh, we should probably call it and then we'll continue this discussion as we get our books signed and, and uh, meet each other. So let's, uh, let's uh, thank our speakers tonight. Thanks again to the Carnegie Institution. Thank you so much. It's really good for you.